Thank you, Zoom lady. One day I want to meet the woman who did that voice and say like, thank you. I appreciate everything you did for us. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Romans chapter one, verses 16 to 23. It can be found on page 1026 of the Pew Bible. And the word reads as follows. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 24 to 40, which can be found on page 973 of the Pew Bibles. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be astonished at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good, to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies on my behalf, and I know that his testimony to me is true. You sent messengers to John, and he testified to the truth. Not that I accept such human testimony, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But I have a testimony greater than John's, the works that the Father has given me to complete, the very works that I am doing, testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified on my behalf. You have never heard his voice or seen his form, and you do not have his word abiding in you because you do not believe him whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, and it is they that testify on my behalf. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. This is the word of the Lord. Invisible. Anybody ever see that show Soap that used to be on? Yeah. Remember Burt Campbell? I'm invisible? He used to do that all the time after the aliens abducted him. It was a spoof on soap operas, and it was so ridiculous. But when I was working on this, I, I remembered him doing that. He used to snap his fingers and tell everybody he was invisible, and his wife would say, I can see you, Burt. You're standing right in front of me. I'm invisible? No, he wasn't invisible. Invisible. Anyone ever feel that way? you know, not noticed or acknowledged, treated as if you really were invisible or maybe overlooked or marginalized. My wife's nephew has been in a wheelchair all his life. 
he's often felt like he was invisible. People would walk by looking over his head, no eye contact, no smiles. It's like the way many people act when they see a homeless person asking for money. Hmm. There's another definition for invisible. And that definition is incapable by nature of being seen, not perceptible by vision. This is more like the kind of invisible we're going to talk about today. Have you ever asked yourself, how much can you learn about someone from asking them a silly question? Well, a bunch of scientists decided that they would do exactly that. So they did a study and they asked a bunch of business and professional leaders who read their leadership blogs online. And the question that they asked was this, if you were given a choice of two special powers, which would you prefer, the ability to fly or the power to be invisible? And believe it or not, the answer to this question provided some interesting insights into these leaders. With a difference of almost three to one, 72% of the leaders said they would rather fly than be invisible. And when they looked at the data by the position that they held, it was discovered that 76% of top managers selected the ability to fly. Why fly and not be invisible? It turns out that all of those who selected flight were extremely confident individuals. Those who chose being invisible were much less confident. It makes sense, I guess. Confident people like to be seen and they would choose to be able to fly and get to their next destinations quicker to conduct whatever business they had. Anybody know type A personalities who wanna get to the next task so fast, they wish they could fly. The less confident person would prefer not to be seen so readily. Maybe be able to hang around others and hear what they say about them after they're gone. Can anybody relate to that? Wanting to be invisible at times? Anybody ever see that commercial where somebody makes a really big mistake and the voiceover says, want to get away? It's for Southwest Airlines, but yeah, kind of like that. Sometimes we just want to get away. We don't want people to see us. We don't want them to look at us. We don't want them to know we're there. So that's one definition of invisible. What about our other one? Invisible, incapable by nature of being seen, not perceptible by vision. This definition, I believe, describes God. Last week, Miss Mia asked me a question. You guys remember? Kelly had to duck out and take a call, but she missed it. So Mia raised her hand very politely. And when I said, yes, Mia, she said, are God and Jesus invisible? You guys remember that? Well, that is a great question. One that deserves attention. And it's challenging to answer. A person can easily wonder, especially when we grow up hearing about the tooth fairy, ghosts, the Easter bunny, are God and Jesus like that? Well, not exactly. Do you know how many times the word invisible is in the Bible? Ready to be surprised? Five times. That's it. I looked it up. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be all over the place five times and only in the New Testament. God's grace. Five times. There are numerous scriptures that allude to God being unseen, but the word invisible is not used in them. And we'll be looking at them this morning. This question came up at one of our Bible studies about people who had never heard of Jesus during their lifetimes. What would happen to them? You know, if somebody lives their whole life never being told about Jesus, and then they pass away, what would happen to them? 
Well, Paul addressed this in our reading this morning from Romans. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. There were two men in the jungle. Never heard about Jesus, way, way in the jungle. Never met nobody, no Westerners or anything. And they're in the jungle, and they walk up to a tree, and the first man worships the tree. The second man says, whoever made the tree, that's my God. That man got it. Whoever made the tree is my God. That's what Paul meant, that the power of creation witnesses to God. So according to this scripture, it's possible to see God's invisible attributes. And how do we do that? Through creation, everything around us in nature. So are God and Jesus really invisible? Hmm. I think if we can see their attributes, it shows that they truly exist. And if they truly exist, are they really invisible? In the faith chapter what they call the faith, the faith Hall of Fame, Hebrews 11. It says this, By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Hmm. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. God speaks. All was created by his word spoken, the word of God. And we know Jesus is the word of God. We cannot see words in the air, but the one who speaks them surely exists. Amen? Everything we see was created out of things which are not visible. Then what are we supposed to be looking at? What is all around us? Well, only to start with. As we grow in our faith, Paul tells us this in 2 Corinthians. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen? Invisible. The things we see and touch, what is all around us will not last long. They are only temporary. But the unseen things, the things of the spirit realm, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, heaven, those things will last forever. Invisible, yet very real. We should also remember that whatever we look at, it was all made by Jesus. Paul, again, in the book of Colossians, tells us about this. Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Then Paul continues by saying, for by him, meaning Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. How else can we see God? The Apostle John tells us in his first letter. In 1 John 4, he says, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. And in the 16th verse of that chapter, John finishes his thought this way. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. God is love, and they who abide in love abide in God, and God in them. Abide. It means to live there. Amen. To stay in a place permanently. When we show love and others see that love, they see God because God is love. Amen? Invisible, but seen. Paul talks more about God in his first letter to Timothy. 
he opens up in first timothy chapter one by saying now to the god eternal immortal invisible the only god be honor and glory forever and ever amen bless you devers and at the end of the book paul closes with this in first timothy chapter six who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see to him be honor and eternal dominion amen it's kind of like bookends he starts off at the beginning of the letter talking about god being invisible and then he ends the same way he says that he's invisible and physically unapproachable honor glory and internal dominion belong to him amen invisible what else don't we see hope you don't see hope look how paul defines it in chapter 8 of romans for in this hope we were saved but hope that is seen is no hope at all for who hopes for what he can already see does that make sense if i'm hoping for a cough drop and i'm standing here with a cough drop in my hand why am i hoping for it because it's right here I'm not hoping for it because here it is, but I hope for things that I cannot see yet. Amen. It would be like me saying, I hope I can become pastor of Scotchtown Church. You would all say, well, what the hell is the matter with you? You've been pastor here for a year. So we don't need to hope for things that we see. So what hope is Paul talking about? Our hope to be redeemed by God on the last day. We hope for Jesus' return and our gathering together with him. This hasn't happened yet, so we continue to hope for that. Invisible, yet attainable. And how do we conduct ourselves in our everyday lives considering this? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Because Paul has the answer to that too. In 2 Corinthians 5, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We look at what is invisible and cannot be seen by nature. But we know, <clears throat> excuse me, we know and believe it is real. Jesus began as one with God, there but invisible. But by God's Spirit, Jesus was made alive as a human. He was born in a manger. He grew up and taught everyone about God, his father, and he taught about God's Holy Spirit. Jesus was not invisible then. He was here. Maybe part of God sending us his son so, was so that we would know how real God is, even though we can't see him. Invisible. So Jesus showed who God is, what God is about, how real God is, because Jesus was part of God. And when Jesus was resurrected and returned to heaven with God, Jesus and God sent us the Holy Spirit to help us remember. To help us know God and Jesus that we cannot see. We cannot see the Holy Spirit either, but when we, by faith, believe in Jesus and God the Father, then they give us God's spirit of love, which lives in our hearts. By faith, we believe that even though we can't see them, that they are not invisible because they are very real. They exist in all creation. They exist in the words of our Bible. They exist in the spirit of love. And if we search with the eyes of faith, we see them with us always. Invisible, but tangible to us. Amen?